We're officially live. Podcast awesome. time. Although I'm going to cut this part out because oh, it's dumb. Okay. Yeah. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe I'll leave it in. <laughs> I'll leave it in. Get the extra couple minutes out of it, right? Anyways. Welcome back to the Euroforce Podcast, episode five. Uh, we've got back to the uh, more traditional forest topics. We're going to talk about wildfire today. Uh, by wildfire, I mean forest fires. I got my buddy Colin Peranich on today. He is a registered forestry professional in the province of Alberta. Um, yeah, we met in university and we both did uh, Hell Attack for three summers. I did three summers. What did you do? Yeah, yeah three summers. Yeah. yeah. So we got a little bit of uh, experience fighting fire and so kind of what goes into that. And also with our forestry background, I feel like we're kind of... You know, we got a little bit to say about fire. We can discuss the general properties of it. I don't think we're professionals in any way about it, but <laughs> we can talk to the public about it. Anyways, so um, yeah, anyways, let's uh, get right into it. So basically the importance of fire, just talking about fire in the land base, right? So talk about um, basically how the boreal forest, it's all basically rejuvenated by fire and fire activity. Uh, that's the gist of it, the simple of it. Um, pine trees, especially they have their cones have a resin that keeps them all together really, really tight. And although they do open up with, uh, direct sunlight, really, really intense sunlight, a lot of times, uh, the fire will force all of them to open up and create this massive explosion of new pine trees after a fire. So the resin actually, or the, the fire heats up the resin, opens up the cones, allows all the seeds to fall out. So that's, that's needed on the landscape to allow pine to come back, uh, as foresters, we actually do scarification, which is supposed to be replicating that process. So all the pine cones that are on the ground are actually, they have a, this machine that drags a bunch of stuff behind a, behind, behind another machine. And it, uh, it basically just like tears up the ground and, and, and stirs up all the cones and kind of breaks them open so that the seeds come out and that's supposed to be replicating fire activity. Right. Um, yeah, fire, it's super important. You need need it on the lands base, so it's it's not it's not just this big scary thing that's causing all these problems. You know, burning down towns. Although, like even my hometown where I grew up was actually one of the first to burn down in in the province. It's kind of weird, but yeah. yeah, yeah. People think of fire as being a big that big destructive force on the landscape and mm-hmm. causing millions of doubt, do- millions and millions of dollars in insurance damage and yeah. homes and yeah livelihoods destroyed, but you forget to bring it back down to its base mm-hmm. purpose and that's to have ecosystem yeah. turnover and new growth and um, restart succession yeah. over again. So succession just meaning, yeah, new growth, getting getting the forest back to square one where it can start over with, with, with different species and basically just increasing biodiversity and changing the landscape over, right? So... Yeah, it's uh, it's a really important feature, and I think a lot of people it is is kind of uh, it's kind of glorified in a bad way in the media, I guess, right? Because the only media it gets is bad media, right? It's just it's just oh, yeah, it's yeah. you know BCs of being evacuated and towns are being evacuated, people are losing their homes and stuff, and that's horrible. Like I, I have family members myself who lost their home in the Slave Lake fire. Uh, I know lots of people who lost places in Fort Mac. And uh, it's horrible, obviously, being displaced like that, losing all of your things, it's brutal. Um, and we can get into that a little later, but that's a result of some management practices as well as climate change and some other things. But um, we'll get into that a little bit later. So as far as the basics of fire, fire, it's always been here, right? It's always, it's evolved with the forest. Like it's it's part of the forest. It's always been there way before we were, right? The, when the earth was created, the whole thing was on fire, right? And that just continued. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh yeah, um, yeah. The fire it helps with well, nutrient recycling, especially is a, is a really big one. So a, a big fire comes through, burns out all the all the all the forest material, all the vegetation, right? And although you lose habitat and you lose all that old growth and all that stuff, you're getting a quick breakdown of that fiber, that wood fiber and that vegetation fiber into ashes, which goes back into the, into the soil and, 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 and replenishes that soil on a giant scale. Like, I mean, you think about like one tree going down in the bush because of a pathogen or something like that or insects, right? And then you get, okay, sure. You got a little bit of like nutrient recycling going on there, going back into the soil from the trees. But if you have a fire going through, although a lot of that carbon is being burnt off, a lot of that fiber is going right back into the soil at a massive scale. So you've got a crazy rich soil all of a sudden all over again, right? It's yeah, a, it's yeah. a, yeah. 
and that that's how these species evolved like the, the like you were mentioning before with the pine tree that's a mm-hmm. a fire species that evolves over time yeah to to live with fire and to be able to reproduce very effectively yeah post fire yeah so yeah no, it's uh yeah it's 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 always been there it's super important for for the fire for forest ecosystems and um nutrient replenishment and new growth so a big one for new growth like i've been saying in the past uh similar to cup locks and that it creates a situation which browsers like uh moose and deer all of a sudden they've got all this new growth coming up that they can feed on and they're they're not looking for stuff to eat in the winter winter time when they got to dig through four feet of snow to try and find grass that's dry and cured and shitty old grass that nobody wants to eat (laughs) who wants to eat hay when you can get yourself a nice you know Nice big chunky bud on the top of an aspen tree. <laughs> chunky buds. <laughs> so anyways, um, yeah, so that's that's kind of some of the importance of, of fire in the landscape. It's not just this big scary thing. It's not like Bambi, you know, Bambi's mom died or whatever it was. Or Bambi. Yeah, yeah, that's, I've listened to a couple of your old podcasts and keep coming back to the Bambi. I, like I don't know, man, I got nothing to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, that's the one thing is, you know, like it's hard to see that fire in a positive light. Mm-hmm. So you have to kind of paint it with that positive light. And yeah, yeah, you know. for sure. It's, it's, you have to point out to people that, yeah, it's, although we want to suppress it, we also want to let it go in places where we need to let it go. So that kind of ties into, um, kind of ties into the, uh, the whole suppression thing, I guess. And, where problems arise like people look into places like bc and alberta and we're seeing all these giant and saskatchewan northern saskatchewan even and we're seeing all these crazy huge fires that are just seem to be blown out of proportion and they're like destroying homes and they're destroying communities and they're they're just it just seems to be so like apocalyptic in relation yeah, and that, to that's the trend we're getting to now is we're getting to be in a live in a time where these massive fire events are going to be happening happening more and more often mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to be bigger. We have older forests now. We have a lot more fuel on the landscape, so we have to learn how to live with them. Yeah. Not only just how to use it, but you know how to, how to live with it, how to manage it, how to mitigate mm-hmm. wildfire on that landscape, especially with you have these multi users on the landscape. Yeah. No, is, for sure. Yeah. It's it's well, it's a it's a it's a huge thing because I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly when we started suppressing fire on a lo- on a huge scale, but I think it was in the fifties somewhere roughly. That's when we kind of started keeping track of forest fires. Is in the fifties. That's when we have. Uh, we have records of them and how big they were, kind of the general outline of where where they took place, right? And uh, we can see that the, the the intensity of fires has gone up. So if you look at the history of forest fires in the past, a lot of times forest fires, it's, it's not like you see on the news. It's not like every time a forest fire starts, it's this big giant thing that's blown through the canopy and burning out the whole forest and leaving nothing left, right? It's, it's most of the time, most forest fires... I think I read the stats the other day. I think 95% of the forest fires in Alberta are under a hectare. They're tiny little things. Like it's just a, a bolt of lightning yeah. hits a tree, right? Lights up that tree and it goes out because what happens? What comes with lightning? Rain. So it just puts itself out, right? That's 95% of them. It's something like that, right? Or it might hit the, hit the tree. It goes through the grass a little bit and kind of peters out or whatever. It doesn't quite, doesn't have the ladder fuel. And the ladder fuel we talked about in previous podcasts is just, uh, it's just, it's a fuels of those ground fuels that allow fire to travel from the ground up into the canopy. So yeah. you get on a spruce tree, you get those low hanging branches, mm-hmm. you get out into the forest there, they're touching the ground, especially yeah. with, uh, black spruce. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a great example of a, of a tree that's. Yeah. Super low. Like sometimes you can have volatile black fuel. Yeah, yeah. Super volatile, right? It's, well, it's, you know, you know how sometimes that you have the black spruce branches they grow down into the peat moss and then they or into the moss and then they pop back up on the other side and it'll actually become a new tree with new roots yeah with like yeah. that kind of ladder fuel like i was talking about because it's literally the fire is using it like a ladder to get up to the top of the trees where it can fly and is yeah it's it creates a, a situation where yeah black spruce bogs are, are, are super volatile when it comes to fire yeah it's wild um so yeah talking about uh talking about that kind of, I guess the, the management scale and kind of where we kind of went wrong in the past. Um, in the past we started in the fifties or sixties or whatever it was, 
we started suppressing fires at a massive scale. So we started using water bombers and we started using firefighters and we started really... We as actually as we, had those resources. We had the resources to use, available yeah. to do it, right? And so we would we would get out there and every fire that happened, if we get to it, we put it out right, right away, right? We get out there with helicopters and bucket on it and, and you see those big tankers dropping water and dropping retardant on it and trying to put it out right away. And we're like, yeah, well, we did it. Awesome work. Good work, guys. And then we're kind of starting to realize that because we did that, those a lot of those low those low uh, intensity fires that were supposed to happen that would maybe burn through the grass and the shrub and kind of maybe leave a couple scars on the trees but not really kill the trees they just kind of kill the understory and the forest is still there and allow for some new growth to come up maybe allowing for new habitat to be created those aren't happening as much or they're not they're happening just as much but instead of that now we've got these super old growth forests that are being they're super volatile because they have all these ladder fuels, all this, all this vertical structure that allows it to climb. And then you, and because there's so much of it and there's not a lot of young stuff that's suppressant to fire because it's just young and full of water and there's not a lot of dead stuff in it. There's not a lot of fine fuels for it to start. Um, those things are kind of gone now. Now, all we're, so we're left with this. Instead of having low intensity fires burning through the understory, we've got these massive fires that are just taken over, right? And it's not that to say that what they did was wrong in the past. But maybe we could have, now knowing what we know now, we could have done it a little bit differently because we kind of went out a little bit too much and we're trying to fix that problem. But I mean, there's other things involved in that too, with seeing the big, big, you know, campaign fires that we're seeing in BC. Mm-hmm. Like BC just had like, I read today they had the uh, the biggest fire in BC's history, recorded history. It was over, it was almost 500,000, uh, or no, it was almost 5,000 square kilometers. Wow. Which is like huge for British Columbia. Um, it's even, it's huge for Alberta too. It's huge for everywhere, right? It's a massive, crazy fire. They've had the most fires, I think, on, on record as well, I think. So they've got lots of crazy it's stuff a, going It's on. a dry year for that. And it's the wildfires there, they start going and they just, they're, they're cooking after a while because of all the pine beetle. Yeah. And there's just not enough moisture. There's no rain to... Mm-hmm give these firefighters a chance to get at it yeah so So, yeah let's talk about that like so pine beetle example for a good example for in british columbia right so uh pine beetle why would pine beetle maybe you can explain it kind of why pine beetle would be such a problem for forest fires yeah yeah so having a one of the biggest factors in wildfire spread is spotting if you haven't heard of spotting before it's when you get um these embers caught in this updraft of the fire and travel kilometers ahead of the fire they land on some dry tinder mm-hmm. and some leaves and they can start a fire ahead of it so that's how these large scale fires can travel f- large distances in a short matter of time yeah so it doesn't necessarily mean that if a big fire hits a highway where you've got a 30 meter stretch of oh there's no vegetation we stopped the fire yay it's like no not really because that stuff is getting blown over the highway and starting at a rate that firefighters can't keep up with possibly yeah, yeah. right so it's with mountain pine beetle, you're getting all these pine trees on a mass scale dying. So you get all these, the boles of the trees are still standing. And so the trunks, yeah. Yeah, the trunks of the trees are still standing. Yeah. And which offers perfect amount of drying and curing of the fuel. Yeah. And then you get this big fire to come through. So all that fuel is burnt up at a faster pace than if it was green. Yeah as well as the bark on the sides of it is a lot more looser. Yeah. So when you get that big updraft, you can get these massive chunks of bark and I'm holding up size of my head, I guess, <laughs> two sizes of my head. And they can travel 10 to 15 kilometers. Yeah. That's, that's well, it's, it's way nuts. more than what we saw in the past. Yeah. It's crazy yeah. how far they can travel. And yeah, like you're saying the, so just imagine, uh, you cut down, uh, a tree, that's a green tree. It's alive. And you try to put it. So it's like trying to put leaves on a fire. You ever put leaves on a fire and it just kind of sits there and smokes. And maybe after five or 10 minutes, it will catch, it'll catch fire. Right. Uh, that's kind of what you're dealing with in, in, in a live stand. Whereas if you were to take all these little twigs that are dried up and broken and you can break them with your hands, no problem. You throw those on the fire that goes up like stink, right? And just explodes. It's like, it's almost, it's almost like gasoline on it. Right. And so that's what you're dealing with with pine beetle. You're dealing with these these giant stands of mature pine, which is already a pretty sappy, pretty, there's lots of fine fuels like the needles that catch fire easily. It's already kind of, it's easily caught fire. So yeah, it's, it's, you, a you, it's a volatile species. It's a volatile species. And once, as soon as you, 
dry it out and 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 kill it the way it is then it then it's then it's just a whole different story right like you can't stop it there's nothing so people look into places like slave lake i remember uh after the fire hearing a lot of people that are they're frustrated people and they've just lost their homes and they just need someone to blame and they need and i i'm not of course it's horrible right but a lot of them they go and they'll go why didn't you stop it like you 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 had this they, they remember the night before where there was it was calm or not calm but it was you know we seen it coming. You could have stopped it then. Like, why didn't you do something? And then they don't realize that we were doing everything we could. Um, and it was trying to stop that fire from, from, from spreading into town. But when you have hundred plus kilometer hour winds blowing at a fire that is, let's say a half a kilometer wide and it's, 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 it's licking flames across the highway. It's like a blowtorch. Like you can't stop that. It's just like this giant blowtorch the size of a town going through going through the forest right like you can't no amount of water or retard by the time you try to drop water on it it's evaporated before it's even hit the flame just because it's that hot right like you try and get yeah. if you were to try it'd be a waste of time to get a water bomber to, to try and lay water on an active flame front because it would just it wouldn't even hit the ground it would just it would dissipate and evaporate before it even hit the flame right so like what they do is they wait until maybe nightfall or maybe a little bit of rain to knock the flames down. And that gives the helicopters and planes an opportunity to actually hit that spot and like get low so that the water actually gets there. But it's, it's, this is a crazy topic. We're going all over the place. Yeah, it's, it's easy too. It's easy. There's, yeah. You can go off on a tangent on a tangent about wildfires. Tangents, so tangents, talk about tangents. Yeah. yeah, so many tangents. And as some people might know, uh, Colin and I, real good at tangents. Yeah, yeah, we're <laughs> like Matt said, we've been we've known each other for years now and it's we can easily talk for hours about stuff like this. So, yeah, usually a little yeah. bit more profanity maybe involved, but a little bit beers. more a little more professional, I guess this time. Let's yeah. <laughs> well, going out for the world yeah. to see we can't uh can't know, let them know who we really are. <laughs> <laughs> uh so yeah, anyways, talking about the management and kind of where we went wrong in the past, kind of how we I wouldn't say we went wrong. Went wrong we we, we like, have that you have that obligation to put the fire out for public safety exactly um but it's it's a cumulative effect you know yeah it's cumulative effect you're right now, now we up. have all that that mature to over mature mm-hmm. stands out there those yeah. four stands that are historically not supposed to be there yeah and if they At were historically there then they yeah. all burnt up yeah and you get that ecosystem regeneration there yeah no exactly it's yeah that's the wrong word i shouldn't have said we went wrong i should have just said it where we or maybe a little misguided in in what we were doing, and we have to protect towns, right? We have to protect people's livelihood, infrastructure, businesses, all those things have to be protected. And that's kind of what happened is as we moved into the forest, as we do, like you see all these beautiful cabins in the middle of the mountains with the pine trees and cedars next to them, and kind of over top of the house and stuff. You're like, oh, look at how beautiful it is! It's so nice. Mm-hmm. And like, meanwhile, that place is going to burn anytime. Just yeah, waiting yeah. on the right lightning strike. It's going to go up because there's no protection there. You got Cedar Shake House in a you know a pine forest that's like on a slope and all these different things. Yeah, like it's just like, it's I remember. A storm. I can't remember. It was one of our professors in university he said everybody likes the sound of a babbling brook, but until it's flowing through your living room, <laughs> which is it, you know it transfers onto forestry. Saying yeah. you know everybody likes to see the trees and everything around their house until there's a fire coming through. Then you want to just get rid of them. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's just it, right? Yeah. It looks people are upset about uh, you know cutting around towns or, or cut blocks in your highways and stuff like that because it looks ugly. Well, it looks ugly right now. In five years' time, you're not going to know there's a cut block there. It's going to be coming back so fast, right? But places like Slave Lake, after the after the fire came through, uh, the forest companies were they went through and they were creating swaths of forests that were allowing for basically fire breaks, keeping the fire away from important resources, and the public is totally fine with it. They're like, yeah, that's good. Let's let's keep doing that because like we don't want this to happen again, right? So as soon as you have informed people, then it becomes a lot easier to make the right choices. As soon as the people understand why you're doing it, right, rather mm-hmm. than just thinking that like oh well it's not as pretty as it was and it's like well this is the natural succession of this forest right is to do this so but yeah fire as it, it, we even use it as a management tool right like we're, we're talking about prescribed burns right so yeah yeah in the springtime especially yeah. yeah yeah so prescribed burns can be used like especially in like national parks and stuff like that they use it a lot for for burning out places that are problem areas because like obviously in national parks provincial parks we've got a lot of tourists 
there's a lot of infrastructure there as far as like cabins and and trails and and, and people wanting to use that resource and that's a like a big amount of income coming in for the country right we want to keep that going we want to keep our parks looking clean and pristine and 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 happy and healthy right and so they will go through and people might be upset like oh my like my favorite hiking trail like they they burnt it all out like those like what the heck were they doing like this is so ridiculous like get, people get pissed right and it's it's fair enough because it's like your favorite spot and now now it's been set back to a a, a different time stamp and you have to deal with this burnt out forest that you're walking through and getting ash all over you. Right. And it happens, but that's part of, I think people need to see that that's part of the natural landscape and that's, it's beauty in its own way, seeing those burnt out trees and seeing like, Oh, look at this. And then you come back the next year and like, Oh, look at these little like inch or two inch like saplings coming up. Right. It's kind of cute. Yeah. And then, and then like the next year you come back and like, Oh my God, it's already a meter tall. And then, you know, 10 years later you come back and you can't see, you can't put your arm in the bush without, you know, not seeing it because it's so thick now with vegetation coming back or whatever. Right. But so what they do with prescribed burns is they'll go through and do that. They'll take a, they'll take a, a, a non windy day and they'll find the right. Usually weather. in the fall, usually in the fall yeah. or the springtime when they know there's maybe there might be rain coming in the forecast so they can burn something out. There's no wind, low wind, and they can, uh, they can comfortably have resources on hand to control where the fire spreads to. Right. And they can, make sure that only the piece they want burnt is burnt. Sometimes it doesn't always go that well. Sometimes like the weather's unpredictable. Like, I mean, you talk to a meteorologist, right? Like I, I once talked to a meteorologist friend and he said, man, I have the only job where I can be right 30% of the time and be given a pat on the back for doing a good job. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, 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 they're predicting. They can't say, right? So how many times have you and I been on a fire where you're sitting there and you go like, okay, we got this thing down. I think we've got it taken care of because you're, you're putting out the head of the fire type thing. And all of a sudden the wind shifts 180 degrees and the head is now 300 meters away on the other side. And by the time you get there, it's already roaring again, right? Like that yeah, kind of, yeah. that, that stuff happens and it's, so it's unpredictable, but you're literally, literally playing with fire yeah literally playing with fire yeah. and and the climate too right you're dealing with with weather and you, all kinds of different things that you can't control but they do their best at trying to make sure that they do that at the right time in the right spot in the right situations and sometimes they'll hold off prescribed fires for like three four five years i, I, I don't know they hold off for a long time i've heard of situations where they hold them off for years because the right opportunity did not present itself right and then finally, when they got to do it, people were pissed because it's in sight of a town and they don't like looking at this big burnt out hill slope or whatever, right? Yeah, but, especially in Jasper, I know they'll, yeah. they'll burn off a the whole side of a mountain. Yeah. Just a, a period of a couple of days just yeah. to yeah, cause, reset because yeah. they, they still fight fire in the in the parks. Yep. They do have fire crews. Well, but they have they, to. Yeah. They have to because like I said, it's such a high valued resource that like everybody wants to go to and go hiking and, and go see elk and, and sheep and grizzly bears mm-hmm. and all these things. And even just see the lakes and fish for trout and, and, and see birds that they don't get to see and cougars and goats and all this stuff. And if you let it all burn, then yeah, you got a problem. But so obviously they do do suppression in, within the, within the parks, but yeah, they just trying to let people know that, that, that fire is, is, is not a natural. And when you see it, it's don't be upset about it, especially with prescribed burn. These people are trying to do this in your best interest. And I, I wonder, I, I wonder actually how many times you get a prescribed burn goes through and burns out an area pr- appropriately. Right. And the following year, in the next five years, you have a big crazy fire that comes up and just stops right at that spot because of that prescribed burn. Right. I wonder how many times that's happened and gone undocumented and un unknown by the public because the media is not going to say hey they saved us with that fire they did five years ago that's not a good story nobody's going to read that like it's yeah like, like, I, like I, telling the story yeah. about destruction and and chaos and and people have been you know, removed from their homes and stuff so that you don't hear that stuff all you see on the news is, is the bad and the bad press and you don't get any of the good stuff that fire brings you yeah yeah you know? yeah yeah i know in for prescribed burns you were talking about <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it burning up and stopping right and that's what you do around communities too especially around that like river valleys and around matted grass it will burn out the river valley yeah we used to in do the a lot of that, time right? and there's still a little bit of snow on the ground or it's just gotten off mm-hmm. and it's still cool out and it'll it'll be able to snuff itself out in the night yeah um but yeah we used to do that every spring and just burn yeah. off the ditches burn off river beds and it's valleys really and stuff yeah it's fun it's the best <laughs> unfortunately i never got to be any of the igniters on the oh no you no, never got to no. use a drip torch or anything? I got to use one, but I never got to do it in the springtime. Oh, was, yeah. You get those, just timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You just weren't there. Yeah, yeah. I, I got the opportunity to do it quite a few times. I remember one time we were um, 
shepherded some grass close to close to Slave Lake. Actually, I think it was pre, yeah, pre two thousand eleven, pre the big fire that burnt through. But we were burning through some grass and some kind of young vegetation, really like right up against people's houses, literally up against their fences, and uh, super highly volatile. Like you just got grass on top of grass on top of cured grass on top of cured grass on top of, then you got dead willow on top of it, and you've got like all this stuff that's like if someone if if, if some kid rode by and and flicked a match into this, like these houses would go up, right? So like that kind of yeah. stuff. So anyways, we were in there doing that. I remember it was what, my first time. I think it was my first year. And uh, or no, it would be my second year in Hell Attack, and uh, first time doing prescribed burns, and I was walking around with this drip torch, which is basically just like a canister filled with diesel and gasoline, a mixture of it, with a an end that allows just drops, kind of slow drops, to come out. So it's not pouring out; it just drops come out, so it's more controlled. And you can just tip it up, and it'll stop flowing, right? And you just light that on fire, and you just walk. And uh, you know this. I'm just talking with the people. Oh, no, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyways, I remember doing that, and it was taking a while, and there was no one around. It was it was a really controlled situation. We had so many people, or not, I don't around, I mean no public. We, we had so many firefighters around, and we had people with side-by-sides that had water, and we had, everyone had a, a Wajax bag on, which is just a big, I don't know, what do you call it? Just a, just a big rubber bag full of water, water bag, it's, just, yeah. it's, it's, it's it's the best water gun ever is what yeah, it is it's, yeah, it's the greatest water hand gun pump ever. yeah it's got a hand pump and it just it shoots water like super crazy. soakers have nothing on these things yeah they're awesome actually my dad used to use them to take us out as kids <laughs> they hurt they're not they're not pleasant when you're like seven years old you get blasted in the face with a way bag yeah yeah <laughs> thanks terry appreciate it <laughs> character building yeah character building yeah um but anyways uh, we're, so we're doing this fire and, and my, uh, my coordinator actually, he grabbed me and he's like, he's like, Hey, like this isn't going fast enough. Just like jump on the side by side and like, just like go that way. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, like use the drip torch, get on the side by side and just drive that way. And I was like, really? So I was on the, on the side by side, driving the side by side, just kind of dripping fire out on the side of me. Right. And it's burning out all this grass and I'm just, I'm just having the time of my life. Cause I was like, this is awesome. And it's all super <laughs> controlled and there's nothing was going to go wrong. We had so many people around, but like seeing all that matted grass go up and how high some of those flames were just from that drip torch that I put down was insane. You have seven or eight foot flames temporarily because it's only grass. So it's going to burn out in a second, right? It's not going to take long. It's going to burn out in, I don't even know. Like I think it took us, after I lit it, it was like maybe 15 minutes to burn this like giant, like it was like, I think it was like three hectares worth of area. Or maybe not that big. Maybe it was only a hectare, but yeah. Yeah, about a hectare worth of area in like, in like yeah, it's a really short period of time. Yeah, there's a lot and of it, energy in that stuff. And once it's gone, it's just the soil left, right? But uh, I remember doing that and thinking man this is wild and i at the time i didn't have any real fire experience and i was watching these eight foot flames climb towards these these aspen trees right and in my mind i'm like oh my god like i know this is supposed to stop but like i don't know if it's gonna like i think we better get over there and like take care of this and it it literally just like it hit that spot and just just stopped just died immediately right where the trees were i was like this is amazing like this is we didn't even have to try and go put it out we did we went through and made sure you know you you test it with your hands, make sure that everything's out so there's no opportunity for it to come up again. But this grass area, it burnt through so fast and it hit the trees and just died because we were paying attention to all the indices. We were paying attention to all the fire indicators and the weather and we knew what was going to happen. We knew that that specific spot was not going to burn for multiple reasons. But yeah, yeah. It was, it's, it's, it's crazy. Those prescribed burns are super important. And from that, and that area... After that, like it wouldn't need to be burned for another maybe five or ten years because it's 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 now it's new growth. There's not as much cured grass. It's not as much of a risk, right? So those people's homes are are not as high of a risk because of that prescribed. Burn. I, I know if in, when I was in Lac La Biche, we would do the same year. Oh, everyone does every, it, right? every year, yeah. once a year, once a year in the springtime. Oh, you guys do down. the same one every time, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I know along like along uh, along the like uh, the train rails and stuff like that yeah we get a lot of man-made it's easy to, or yeah not easy but you're able to see where the trends are and fire starts and where it's more likely to for yeah. a man-made fire to occur totally yeah some and, and ignition then, and then it, yeah and it's do it easy to go out there do a prescribed burn or do some other mitigations such as fire smarting yeah in those areas yeah so. fire smarting all that kind of stuff and it's yeah and they'll, they'll do it every year because it's easy and it's quick and it doesn't require a whole lot of resources to do it in the right under the right conditions, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, you brought up fire smarting. Actually, let's talk about that. So yeah. Fire smarting. Yeah. So, you were just doing that stuff today, actually. So, you're were, you were kind of going over some coordination. So, 
Yeah, yeah. Just uh, <clears throat> basically for people that don't know, Fire Smart is uh, a way of mitigating wildfire on our landscape here, with especially with respect to communities and towns and mm-hmm. human values. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's not just a one type of treatment that'll uh, fall under Fire Smart. There's actually seven disciplines. So there's vegetation fuel management there's public education there's planning there's legislation there's cross training you have interagency cooperation and uh development is the seventh one dropping knowledge and yeah yeah so <laughs> so through a seven fingered approach yeah you can uh mitigate wildfire to a community and that's that's what i'm working with right now Right. So, okay, yeah. So we can go through even just, I, I think I'm going to have a whole other podcast with, I have a few people <laughs> that want to talk about fire smart because it's a big one, right? And it's a, like, a, it's a public service that people want to know about, but generally speaking, <clears throat> fire smarting, you're just eliminating fuels opportunity for, for fire to take over essentially. Right. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's the, that's the big one. That's the one that's, yeah. As far as the application of it, that's what you're doing is you're, you're, spacing trees out for vegetation management you're removing those ladder fuels Mm -hmm. and you're making it to you're ensuring that a ground fire that passes through there Mm -hmm. doesn't make its way up into the canopy and start a crown fire so you're able to directly attack a ground fire with hand crews and yeah yeah and no so that's what yeah yeah, yeah, it keeps that intensity down so you're not dealing with a Mm -hmm. worst case scenario Mm -hmm. you're dealing with something a lot more manageable yeah you can easily access that as well. Yeah, exactly. So just eliminating those those opportunities for fire to become more intense and and take mm-hmm. out a community or something, and like the the public information side of it is kind of informing people that so how to create make your yard and your home more fire smart, right? So not having wood siding and cedar shake, and not having you know a bunch of wood chips on your deck or like. Stuff yeah, like that, yeah. right? Like it's making sure you're not stacking all your firewood for the winter, you know. Like all it's, it's all stacked against the house and you have uncovered yeah. decks and you have grass growing underneath your deck and Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah like you said that old cedar shakes with vinyl siding. Yeah, so know? like for fire smart if you ultimately you'd want to have I mean the best would be like a tin roof. Tin roof with like with stucco siding, which is just rock. No windows. No wind. Yeah, no windows. <laughs> no opportunity for it to come through. Uh, and yeah, like no trees within like a X number of meters of your 30, house. 30 meters or 10, That's what 10 it is, to 30 eh? meters. It's yeah. wild. I got so many trees within 30 meters of my house. Yeah. They're and I live in the city. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> we don't have to re- really worry about a wildfire in the city. Actually, we do. I remember in the River Valley last summer. Oh, yeah. I remember that. In yeah. 2016, my house, was actually. Two or three wildfires that yeah. happened. They were, they were small and manageable, but. Yeah. I was biking that day. I remember like, see, I was like, that's a, that's a wildfire. And they didn't, my friends didn't believe me. They're like, no, it's not. That's just like. You know, some homeless guys having a have a, a cookout or something. Yeah, and it was yeah. like no, 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 no. That's definitely like somebody started that. I, it wasn't lightning. It was in a bunch of willow and river alder and stuff like that. You know, it, so it was it was kids or it was somebody. Like, it was human started, but it was like a fire that was burning mm-hmm. through the river valley. Yeah, it was, it was small. They nailed it pretty quick, I think, with uh, with a structural firefighter crew. But yeah, still they happen. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Even in places like say Lethbridge, they have a a plan to deal with like grassland fires and stuff like you were mentioning yeah. you, these big grass grass fires can just take off and yeah and run it's hard to like you were saying that seven to eight foot flame length yeah that's hard to deal with directly you know yeah. you can't just drop a tanker on that or attack <laughs> it directly you've seen how many times wind can shift and then people get caught and yeah it's, it's all about fighting f- it safely safely number one yeah totally. making sure you're not putting your own safety at risk to put yeah. out a wildfire yeah, exactly. There's nobody standing in front of a wildfire with a super soaker trying to put it out. It's just not. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, when you see these giant campaign fires like in BC and maybe the Richardson fire in northern Alberta or the, or the giant fire that took out Fort McMurray. Um, these yeah, people f- forget about that. Yeah. That Richardson fire that happened in 2011. 20, yeah, it was 2011. Yeah. And that was over 900,000 hectares. Yeah. And that was just north of Fort McMurray. It shut down the oil sands. It 9, shut down the corners. town. Yeah, uh, it didn't evacuate the town. But then you come, you know, they were on alert. Twenty sixteen. Yeah, and then you have another fire there as well. Yeah, yeah, that's it's wild actually to think about. Like it's, but yeah, all that stuff. It's um, 
yeah, it's 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 hard to explain to people that these things. I kind of forgot my train of thought where I was going with that, but <laughs> what I was talking about. Cut it out. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> we'll carry on. I'm not going to edit this stuff. Yeah. Anyways, um, yeah. So we talked about what do we get? I'm just looking through my list here. Things we want to get through. Fire Smart. Um, why they get so big, right? So, oh, the other thing. Yeah, why they get so big. So we were talking about kind of the buildup of fuel from suppression of fire, right? Uh, over the years, but also it's kind of the perfect storm because we're looking at like the climate situation now where, I mean, Alberta alone, we haven't had real tornadoes around. Like we've, we've had we've, tornadoes every year, I guess, but like very small and you just kind of, you don't really even hear about them this year. I think we've had like four or five tornadoes already this year. Crazy hailstorms, all these crazy fires, you got all, everything's like the climate is, is ripe for these chaotic events, right? Like we're hearing, uh, Everything is just getting warm enough. It's creating the perfect circumstances for it's basically the perfect storm. You got to build up a fuel, and you got the climate that's getting more chaotic and more sporadic and less predictable, making it mm-hmm. hard to manage. So it's, I mean, the last till 2011, Slate Lake burnt down. 2016, Fort McMurray burnt down. 2017, BC is like a flame, like everything. Yeah. So and the reason you're not hearing about that is because there's so many these small towns being evacuated you don't get that massive evacuation it's just it's controlled evacuations but it's still like hundreds of these towns are being put on alert it's bananas like it's nuts how 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 much of this is happening now right like it almost seems surreal like maybe it's just like coincidental that we're having all these crazy you know community burning towns or community Mm -hmm. burning fires happening right now but it's not it has to and do it doesn't with doesn't even yeah it affects climate change it's a big yeah. one like it That's, is yeah it creates the perfect situation to allow just those, that extra half a degree or average half a degree or whatever it is and it, it just changes the climate enough where you have maybe you have more winds more winds winds is the biggest thing for fire spread wind yeah is where we huge. really see it is in the springtime uh i get asked all the time as people saying oh like how come there's there's not a lot of snow this year how i guess we're going to have a lot of fire mm-hmm. this year but it's the earlier the spring, mm-hmm. the more time you have between when the snow is off the landscape and green up occurs. Right. The longer that window happen is open. Yeah. The more chance you get these massive fires. So I can't remember what the percentage was. Right. But most of the the massive fires that result in all these insurance claims mm-hmm. and all the massive damage occur in the springtime, like early to mid May. Yeah. Like that was. Yeah, Fort McMurray, that was Slave Lake, and you're getting these winds that are coming across here and just evaporating all the snow, and you're not getting that early spring. Yeah. I remember when Fort McMurray burned down, I was in the bush, I think, two weeks before that, Mm. and you can just feel the vegetation under your feet just crumbling like potato chips, and it had that eerie feeling like something's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, but, you don't drive through with a quad at that point with a hot muffler and just, it happens, right? Mm-hmm, like people, mm-hmm. they joke about that. They joke about ATVs. Maybe like, oh yeah, like I'm going quad in the, in, you know, in the bush. I'm hoping I don't start a forest fire. Ha ha ha. It's like, no, that's, that's for real. That happens. Yeah. Yeah. They, like <laughs> BC, I think Alberta just had an ATV uh, ban on public lands. Yeah. Yeah. No, it needs to happen sometimes because it, it, those, if you get those hot weathers, which like this summer in Alberta we have. It's been it's been hot. It's been like above twenty seven degrees Celsius, above twenty six degrees Celsius, like often. Yeah, which is, which is crazy. It doesn't usually happen. It happens, but not this often. It seems like like today, I think it's twenty seven. Yeah, it's in August. Yeah, yeah, it's August end of August. Whereas yesterday it was fourteen degrees. I think <laughs> mm-hmm. it's weird how sporadic it is. But yeah, the hot weather uh, means a lot of easy drying, right? And the winds. The winds are the scary one. If you have hot weather and you don't have any winds, a fire starts and it kind of meanders and kind of gets this weird shape. It doesn't really head in any specific direction. It just kind of spreads, right? And it's not really as big of a concern because it's not moving as quick. This the rate of spread is slow, so. It's, so it starts up and say we get to it and it's two hectares big. By the time you get bombers on and stuff, it's pretty much contained a lot of times if there's no wind. Whereas if you have wind, like you can get fires moving at like 30 meters a minute, just flying in one direction. It's like a blowtorch going through the bush and it's just, it, it's uncontrollable, right? If you've got that wind, it's just the, the preheating of fuel ahead of it mm-hmm. combined with the angle of the, of the flame aiming towards it and, and licking those fuels and the spotting, like you're saying, the spotting, you can spot like 15 kilometers ahead and it just, it, it gets out of hand so fast. So like wind is obviously, you know, that it's, it's a huge problem. I remember one time 
doing hack actually we got dropped off and it was the we got dropped off on a, on a big fire around 4 p.m which is like pretty common time for it to happen kind of the heat of the day or after just after the heat of the day when peak burning time peak burning time right and it's just basically yep. yeah so your fuels dry out it's the lowest relative humidity of the day mm-hmm. um winds tend to tend winds to tend to pick up a little bit yeah yeah and anyway so we land on this fire and it was pretty big already uh we were kind of taking care of it we were kind of the only crew and then we get a couple other crews coming in some bombers get on it and we got dispatched to another fire a spot fire from that big one and so we jumped in the helicopter as soon as we jumped in the helicopter we heard people going crazy on the ground telling everybody to get up in the air because the winds had shifted and what we were fighting, which was the back of the fire, was now turning into the head of the fire, which is like crazy, crazy. That's how people die. And it's because... That's why that's why there's procedures and protocol on how, yeah. to, how to approach a fire, how to yeah. start attacking a fire. And, exactly. And that's why we started yeah. the back, right? But sometimes you have that situation where we had the wind shifted 180 degrees exactly. And we were up in the air already. Nobody got hurt. It was it was it was it was taken care of. It was managed exactly right. It was done perfectly to get everybody out of there and then to start attacking the different side and to do it carefully. And and, and everything that firefighters do is is safety first, right? It's always safety first. But anyways, um, so we get up in the air and we go to the spot fire within you know spitting distance of the other one, and uh, we get down. We put it out. It's, it was quick. It took us like I think twenty minutes to put it out. Just like a little. Like six foot square area right nothing nothing didn't get out of hand yet wasn't into the ladder fuels and then before we even finished that one we got called to another one we got called to nine fires that day all spot fires from that fire in different one of them was i don't even remember how far it was it was tens of kilometers away like it was a long ways and yeah these things they just the, the wind shifting like it just it, it, it didn't create a bunch of spot fires in one line on the landscape we had a big circle of spot fires from this one in like long distances away from each one of it because it was, yeah, the wind would just kept changing. Right? Yeah. So yeah. And when it gets bigger and it starts making its own weather. Yeah. Through yeah. The, through that updraft and yeah. air currents. And yeah. No, it's, it's wild. So yeah, fires can create their own weather essentially. Yeah. If they, if they get big enough, right. They, they call them saying updrafts. They can kind of create their own. You could create wind or they're sucking their storms. They create storms. storms. Even. Yeah. Yeah. Lightning above that yeah. again because so much yeah. moisture going up in the air and you get all the smoke and you get just it's so much heat rising so quickly it causes some yeah some some yeah interesting weather anyways it's wild it's wild mm-hmm. to, to watch it actually but uh yeah so talk so i guess we didn't really talk about kind of jumped ahead of uh how these things start we didn't really talk about that at all yeah yeah people find it's a little interesting to uh, to know that about 50% of fires are actually human caused. Is that much, eh? I didn't even yeah, know. It's, it's about 50-50. It's wild. So either with 50% uh, being natural cause, mostly lightning, mm-hmm. or holdover fires that will stand or ground for a while and then yeah. light up when the when the time's right. Yeah, we talked about that uh, a couple of podcasts ago, I think. We were just talking about, yeah, how the yeah. holdover fires basically, say a lightning hits a tree, the, the fire kind of goes into the roots and it doesn't really actually doesn't require oxygen because there's no there's no open flame it's kind of just smoldering and it can creep under there for until the conditions are right that there's enough wind and enough and enough heat that things are dried up enough that it can breach the surface and then turn into a forest fire right so that kind of stuff um so yeah so the things like so so people right so you're saying 50 percent is people right so you got ATVs, hot mufflers, and and stuff like that. And on spark quads. arresters aren't spark cleaned them. off and get that big chunk of well, not big a chunk, but a big enough chunk to hold the heat and yep. start a grass fire. Yeah, cigarettes. Right? Cigarette butts are a big one. We yep. had. I remember there was a fire at my grandparents' place when I was small. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it was a guy who threw a cigarette out the window and went and burned up the grass and caught the hay bales on fire and took out a whole windrow. <laughs> hay bales. Yeah. Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's watch that burn for like 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You kind of just let that go, but yeah. yeah. It's, uh, no, the, the, I've seen it happen on the highway too, actually, heading between Edmonton and Calgary. I remember driving one day and I was like, that's an uncontrolled grass fire right there. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do in this highway too, so it's pretty busy. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I had nothing, no way to stop. It's also going to stop and try to patent it out, but I just called... Uh, called the municipality and they took care of it right away it didn't turn into anything but yeah this, I, I almost guarantee that was the cigarettes or you know there's always the old people driving their cars 
with the uh, you know the missing axle on the trailer dragging their the whole trailer on the, yeah, yeah. On, the <laughs> <laughs> on the highway. I don't know if you guys heard about that, but yeah, that was I was telling that I think in the second episode or something talking about the just shooting just just faulty vehicle parts, right? You could even have a muffler dragging on the ground Something's, or on the on the highway, a spark or anything. Any kind of spark source, causes problems, yeah. right? So any kind of heat source causes problems. Um, another one. Uh, so people camping right so people camping in in uh what do you call it um random camping random camping yeah, yeah. yeah. they don't okay. put their fire out they don't soak stir soak again yeah so honestly like people they yeah they so they say soak it stir it soak it again right and then you see all these black embers and you're like oh yeah there's no smoke we're good but nobody like stirs it up to see what's going on underneath because you could it's easy for that stuff to sit like a holdover forever right i remember there's a situation where a guy his quad broke down. He stopped at the, at, uh, in a cup block and he put a warming fire into a, uh, a burn pile in a cup block, right? Thinking like, okay, that's a safe place to pour. But he thinks he's doing the right thing, doing it in the burn pile, right? Which would make sense. The problem is you've got all this charcoal that was created from the burn pile that was burnt in the wintertime. So it can't go anywhere. It doesn't really, it doesn't hold over. It's not, it's not the right conditions for it. And he reheated it to the point where it was easy for it to keep going. For it, to, for it to take off and he left and I, I think it was the next day it started a forest fire right and it's these kind of things happen it's it's people don't really think about it you kind of there's a misconception with fire that like if you can't see the smoke or you can't see the flame like it's good to go but like all it takes is one wind to blow one ember outside of the fire pit or outside of the fire ring or wherever and then you got a grass fire and then you got a forest fire and then you got communities burning um <laughs> And yeah, we were talking about access in one of the podcasts too. We were talking about how people get upset that they're restricting access in an area and they get all mad because like, well, I want to go quadding this weekend or I want to go camping this weekend. It's like, well, you're not allowed to protect yeah, the yeah. forest for future generations and to protect communities and like everything, right? There's so much to be protected. So you have to take that into consideration when you're planning your, your camping and check the fire hazard, make sure you know what to do. Yeah. Public education is huge and that's, that's, that's one of the big, hurdles we have to get over yeah with wildfire management is making sure everyone's aware of yeah. why these things are starting and how you can yeah. mitigate this like how you can protect your property how you can take an active role not just a fire department or a municipality taking on mm -hmm. that role of a fire manager but for you to be aware that your actions have consequences yeah for sure and people yeah, yeah they kind of neglect that responsibility right they don't realize that they're responsible for those actions and yeah you can get you can be criminally responsible for starting a forest fire that burns through some timber or burns through a home or, or a well site or something you can be held criminally responsible if you're found negligent so you want to make sure that anything you do anything you do in the landscape you make sure that that possibility doesn't present itself yeah and that's why there's that forest protection forest and prairie protection act yeah they have uh any anyone working in the bush with industry has to have a minimum amount of firefighting equipment or fire suppression yeah. equipment with them. Yeah, yeah, to make because sure that they, if they yeah. do come across something, they can take care of it, or at least yeah, start if to. Yeah, if their heavy machinery is causing a fire and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, there's all kinds of regulations around it. Definitely, yeah, um, yeah. That covers a lot of it, I guess. But I guess we can talk about uh, more fun stuff. Talk about the hell attack. Talk yeah, about good yeah. stuff. <laughs> funnest job for a. Single person, young single person with no responsibilities. Young single person with no responsibilities, <laughs> indeed. It's a, it's a great, it was a great job. It was awesome to do it in the summertime between school and you'd make yeah. enough money to not starve during the school year. And Pay then, for your beer, let's be honest. Yeah, yeah. My beer too. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but no, I, I still know people who, who are working in fire and it's just, I mean, my hat's off to them. They're busting their ass. There's a lot there. of jobs in it, yeah. for sure. Yeah, you can you can start off in hell attack. You can become a leader. Then you can become a coordinator. You can become a ranger. You can become a like. You know, there's there's a million different mm -hmm. jobs. You can in do a lookout specialist. Lookouts. Woo. Yeah. Lookout. Yeah, working in the fire lookouts. You know, like what's that that guy from uh, the Red Green Show? That's definitely a Canadian reference. Yeah. <laughs> Red yeah. Green Show. The ranger that's all low and up in the up in the tower, yeah. watching. He's all a little bit loopy, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's an awesome job. I definitely advise anybody that wants to go and look into if you want to fly in a helicopter and put up forest fires it's pretty sweet that, yeah yeah it's kind of i definitely 
take flying in a helicopter for granted now. Yeah. Right. You, you took it for granted. And totally then, took it for granted. Like yeah. I, it was awesome at first and then you kind of get used to it. It just becomes a mean, it's just like driving in your car after a while because you're doing it every day, right? You're just yeah. like, oh, I'm in a helicopter again. Awesome. But it's just like, yeah, yeah. you kind of take it for granted and then when you haven't done it in a while, you're like, man, I wish I could do that again. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's a good time and it's such an awesome job. Everyone in it is so, like so much fun. Like it's just such a, it's a lot of hurry up and wait, right? Like we always talk about. So you, you're on the job and you're on a five minute getaway, which means that you have to be in the helicopter and in the air within five minutes of getting the call. So you end up spending a lot of times like, like structural firefighters do just sitting around, right? Doing whatever. Cause you can't, you don't, you can't get into anything because you have to be, a, you know, you're available to get into the means of transportation within a certain X number of minutes. Right. So you can't get into doing any kind of crazy activity. You kind of have to stick to mowing the grass and, cleaning dishes or whatever right like yeah yeah you gotta you gotta be ready to go but during that time you get like it, it's just so much fun you get a lot of camaraderie right it's an awesome job yeah I you get to it. know everybody really well like i still talk to people i mean you worked in slave lake i was in lac la Biche there yeah. and you see each other in the summer times oh, on time. exports and yeah no it's yeah. awesome yeah that's the other thing you get to go exports you get to go so if there's if there's not busy in your district you get to go you might get sent out to the Yukon or the States or BC or wherever. So you get to kind of see some of the country. And That's and how sweet. they fight fire in different provinces. Like in yeah. Alberta where we have the money, we have the means to have, you know, like crews sitting there at five minute getaway yeah. to be able to pay them. Yeah. Um, and for all these resources mm-hmm. to put a fire out immediately. So you, you have these loaded patrols where you get these guys going out into the evenly spaced out into the district into high hazard areas yeah and you a loaded patrol is when you load your helicopter full of gear and you're ready to go as if you were on a fire mm-hmm. or going to a fire but you just fly around and it's usually around areas that are high hazard on the maps so they can calculate what areas are high hazard or yeah. they have locations of lightning strikes within the last few days and you mm-hmm. Go fly with that. See if there's any smoke in the area. Yeah, or around campgrounds along. So a lot of long flying around helicopters. helicopter. So you do a lot of flying around, chasing storms, watching lightning strikes. Yeah, betting on which cloud is going to turn into a storm. Yeah, sitting We're, around on man up, going like, I think that one. That's my horse right mm-hmm. there. That one's going to start some because they happen all the time, right? You get kind of bored laying around, but it's once yeah. you get started, that job is the best job. You get to run chainsaw. You get to watch helicopters bucket. You get to watch. Uh, tankers come in and kind of watch them mm-hmm. do their thing like that's fascinating to watch the precision there right you're flying this it's a free air show it's ridiculous it's insane like, those guys are probably one of the hardest working guys in the province there because oh, they're based out of one district and they can get called across the province on mm-hmm. a moment's notice yeah it's wild it's such a cool experience to watch that stuff mm-hmm. right? if you're sitting on the ground and you get to see like a, a retardant drop right that's it's it's so weird watching this red kind of foam stuff land it just kind of it just looks so alien and so it's 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 so cool to watch it's such an adrenaline rush yeah Mm -hmm. no it's awesome i remember my first fire ever uh actually my first one i did a dozer boss on which was i helped i helped the guy pull a uh, or not pull but we ribboned out an area around the edge of the fire in the middle of the night when the fire's down there's no flame so that cats so uh bulldozers essentially can come through behind us and kind of follow the edge of the fire so that in the morning when the fire kicks up again, it has no place to go. That was my first one. But what I meant to say was my second one, as officially as a hell attack guy, first one I was actually working for West Fraser at the time, but second one, we landed on this fire on, on a road and there was two helicopters and everyone was like just spread out doing stuff. And I had had so much training and like I, I, I and behind my back of my head i knew what to do but when we landed i was like what, what do i do what do i do like, where do i go i'm looking every way i'm looking for someone to tell me what to do where everyone's just spreading and doing what they do because they're so good at it and it's just second nature that if someone's not doing something you do that thing or whatever right or try to support other people but it was kind of funny how much adrenaline was in me and i couldn't sort it out because it was so exciting and then it only took about another couple of fires and i was like okay now i know what my role is and kind of what i'm doing mm-hmm. but it was it was it was crazy to to experience that the first time it was it's it's something that i think everyone should try once or twice yeah it's pretty yeah, sweet yeah. i remember one of my first fires we were was a call one one tree wonder and that's when it gets lightning <laughs> hits the tree and starts burning a little bit and which is like the majority we were of your putting fires. it out and we were just we were rushing like just like it was 
like a house was on fire and stuff <laughs> yeah. like that. So we're out there filling water, panicking, and our leader's yelling at us, telling us to get going. And of course, in the back of his mind, he's laughing because it's, he knows it's under control. <laughs> and uh, the fire got up to this one tree. Save and the candled. squirrel's yeah, house. Yeah, this tree candled. And we looked up and we could see this tree just torching in the middle of the forest. And he's like, come on, come on, guys, let's go, let's go. Oh, we're yeah. running, tripping over stuff. And we finally got it out. You were running, were you? No, no, we weren't right? running. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can't run with chainsaws, Colin. That's no. irresponsible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like it's... Walking briskly. It's the biggest challenge with wildfire is just being able to slow that, your mind down. Yeah. And, like take it all in and just see like, okay, like I can only do so much right now. Yeah. It's managing it's just, your... Yeah, just it's like any, any it's high... One step at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Any crisis situation, right? Like any anytime you've been in a situation where there's something unexpected that happens that's you know in air quotes catastrophic or in your mind catastrophic right and the way that you deal with that and i think like hell attack gets you really good at managing those emotions and like understanding that adrenaline level and kind of maybe even that shock temporary shock right so yeah it's uh yeah it's 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 crazy to think about like it's 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 so much fun definitely do it yeah. Anybody yeah. that wants to go out there and, and apply for, uh, it's for, it's with the government. So yeah, you can go on the government website, look up Hell Attack or Hack or just Google it. You'll yeah. find it. It's I think there. they usually close their applications on November 30th. November 30th, yeah. And start doing interviews for the springtime. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a pretty lengthy process and it's pretty, you know, like there's a there's a physical and there's a, there's all kinds of stuff going on. But you yeah, definitely. If you can get in, do it. It's awesome. So much fun. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Anyways, so yeah, that's pretty much, I think, what we want to do. That's almost an hour crushing it. Yeah. Look at yeah. this, just, just off the cuff. <laughs> Nothing planned, just kind of sit down and... That's good. I mean, it's it's easy to flow. I mean, I don't know what else do you want to talk about. I don't know, man. I think that's pretty much good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as much laughter in this one as like, yeah. we usually have in our conversations, but I guess I just started this one and just jumped right into it. I'm like, hey, so this is Colin. So fire. Hey, so doom and gloom. Yeah, yeah. should have been like, hey, this is Colin... A little bit of laughs, but yeah. Sorry, people. <laughs> I'll have them on again sometime next time. Let's talk about something. Yeah, like you said, there's so many different topics in wildfire, like I mean, just in, in forestry and in environment and everything in general, right? Like it's there's so much going on. It's wild. Like every day, I have people coming. You should do one on this. You should do one on this. And I'm like, man, nobody even listens to this yet. Just relax. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, they get a listenership before we start pumping out a million different ideas. But I do have a, like a giant list of stuff that I want to do. Yeah, and it's like I'm I'm pumped. I'm I'm excited for this thing to to get out there. Yeah, it's gonna be good, man. Yeah, no, it's good. Thanks for having me. I mean, cool. it's awesome. To, Thanks for coming on, man. We'll have you on yeah. again. And let's go get a beer or something. Yeah, I could do that. Take this to the next level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah. So thanks for listening. Uh, this has been the Your Forest Podcast with me, Matthew Kristoff, and my buddy Colin Peranich. Good friend. Anyways, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, if you guys have any questions or anything like that. Uh, you can get a hold of me at your forest podcast at gmail.com. Um, yeah, that's it. See you guys. That's all she wrote.